you know, but I've met a lot of goers that aren't very happy that have, you know, found ways to get material success and to do things, but yet haven't found that contentment or satisfaction in it. I think you really just train ourselves to focus and people, a lot of people say, I don't have the time for that. But once I get successful, you know, once I get over this hump, I'm going to take the time for that. Well, it's just more training over training ourselves not to be present. And the more we train ourselves not to be present, the harder that is to break. I have, I've found that, uh, focus makes us more efficient. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Eric Holzap, who's going to share how to live life on purpose. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and create harmony to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. Today's quote is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. What lies behind you and what lies in front of you pales into in comparison to what lies inside of you. The biggest unexplored depths are in ourselves. Take the time to go there. We're going to chat about that today. Before we continue, let's review last week's action step, which was to choose powerfully. What will serve me in the best way? What other possibilities are possible? Thinking through what you want and then question everything and say no to what doesn't fit your life. It's your choice. Make it happen. You get to live in mediocrity of society or on your own terms. And that's our topic for today as well. Question, is profit a bad word? Owning a business called Profit Comes First, I know it sets some people off. But profit's not bad because this is where abundance comes from, the extra. If a business or you personally don't have excess, it leads to struggle. Most people live in struggle because they spend too much. Just same thing that business owners do. We can have profit and we can give at the same time. This is not about greed. Only when we create the gap can we breathe. And as you'll hear today, focusing on the breath is the first step to finding peace inside of you. I know you're going to enjoy our guest today. He has varied experiences throughout life and some of the lessons he's learned. Eric Holzapple has a PhD in economics. He's been a real estate CEO and developer for nearly 40 years, lectured at real estate at Colorado State University for 20 years, and he's practiced yoga and meditation for 30 years. He has a unique perspective on how merging business and mindfulness can be a catalyst in changing lives. He's the founder of Living in the Gap. He's got many popular workshops that teach CEOs and professionals a different way to operate mindfully while improving the bottom line. Eric's written numerous articles in real estate and economics and has a book entitled Profit with Presence that's going to be published in early 2023. Let's meet Eric. Welcome to Richer Soul, Eric Holzapple. It's great to have you join us today. Thank you. It's a privilege to be on. I appreciate it very much. 
And I'm excited to learn from you today. We like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Well, you know, I grew up and my dad was a coach and during the summer he ran a camp and I grew up working from the earliest times I can remember. We were, you know, five, six years old. He, he created little little jobs for us. And as we got older, it was bigger jobs. Uh, so I, I learned early that you earn, you got money by working, you know, and I uh, learned to work. My dad was a real worker, worked you know, seven days a week, loved to work, and he instilled that in us. So I learned you earned money and you saved money, and that's how you got ahead. And uh, it was instilled in us at a very young age. What kind of coach was he? He football, basketball, and then later he retired. Uh, he went from coaching to superintendent of schools, and then he trained horses in retirement. So he liked all kinds of coaching. What did he do in retirement? He mostly did woodworking and trained horses. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, trotters and pacers. So quite, that's uh, quite a shift there at the end. Yeah, he was. He, he used to say, well, they don't talk back. He liked the horses. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess he was lucky. He coached in a very different era than today. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it was a lot easier, right? They did what you told them to. A lot often, yeah. So what, were the little jobs around the house, or was it more with helping no, with coaching? it was a camp. So it was a boys rec camp. We were in Maine, and uh, he coached in Valley Stream for a while and got some connections. So it was bringing uh, city kids from New York and Massachusetts up to the lake, and later it was a campground. So I grew up cleaning toilets and collecting trash and raking campsites and working in the camp store. All those kind of things uh, from and it was kind of cool, too, because we used to move out of the house like from Memorial Day and not back into Labor Day. We had a little our own little cabin that we uh, got in. And there were just a ton of mentors, too, that were around the camp, different people that worked there that were school teachers and coaches and things that came in and out of the camp. And it was it was a really rich environment. I have a place there today. Uh, we go every every summer. Did you get paid? Yeah, we did. Not okay. a lot, but we got paid. Definitely. He paid us for everything. That's yeah. nice. It's just interesting. I mean, around us. the house, we didn't get paid. But if it was at camp, it was a, it was a it was a business and he paid us. I mean, we started, I remember it was like 10 cents, you know, back in the day. But. But it was something. What were some of those lessons that you learned from those mentors? Oh, man. Uh, one of the biggest ones I learned was just the lessons of connection and listening to people. What a difference it was. I could tell as a little kid if someone was paying attention and not paying attention and just the, that attention that I got, a lot of those just made a huge difference in my life. So um, in addition to, you know, working hard and being honest and telling the truth and all those things, it was also just the power of connection. And, you know, it's funny because that's not something we're taught in school, right? Not at all. No. Could be, but it isn't. I think we're in for a transformation of education at some point here, but. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. It will transform. I hope so. Let's say this. It's going to transform what it transforms to. I don't know. Yeah, I think COVID really woke people up to the possibilities in education and the possibilities of doing things differently and how to. um how to take control in a sense, or also whether or not they loved what they were doing or not doing in school and, and actually getting kind of a peek behind the curtain. A friend that called it the gifts of disruption. Yes. You know, what, what the disruptions taught us and also what things stuck through it and what things with that little shake up said, hey, we need a different paradigm here. And I guess we were kind of lucky. We were towards the end of school by the time that happened. And because my kids had changed the way they were learning towards the end of high school, they were already used to being on the computer and learning that way. Mm. So when COVID hit, it was just like, we don't know anything different. Like we're already working in an online environment, taking classes in that way. And so for them, it was an easy switch over and they just continued right along and no big deal. <laughs> so that was good. So you, you learned at camp, you get out, um, 
get a little education and then off into the world of working? What happened? Well, initially, you know, I had some jobs during college and then got through, uh, went all the way through MBA and went out in real estate. And work was really a savior for me. I mean, I, I wasn't uh, a good student in high school. I was smart, but I, you know, sports was probably the only thing that got me through. And then work, every time I worked, I rose to the top of things. Uh, so that gave me the confidence in school and the desire to go back and get school. So it would, you know, promote me at work was my preliminary, uh, my primary thing. And then uh, I was really successful in my 20s. I went to work for an Australian firm. They were in and that was in the 80s and they were in, the Japanese were in, and they were kind of really making a big splash in real estate. And I was the first employee for an Australian company here was they were coming in and growing. And I ended up, I was a financial analyst and then a general manager and then ended up being CEO for them. I, I was operating in Los Angeles, ran offices in Denver through to New Jersey. And uh, it was really stressful on the other side because I had no control over my schedule. I traveled one week, I mean, one year I remember I traveled 50 weeks uh, and uh, was drinking too much. My diet wasn't good. So I was rising to the top title wise and position wise and those kind of things. But I was really stressed and really unhappy. And I remember uh, I got transferred to Boston. They had a New York Stock Exchange company in Boston that they wanted help with. I did well with everything else they asked me to do. So they transferred me there. And I remember getting an apartment and setting up saying, I better get a scale. I got a scale set on it. I stood on this thing. It was like 50 pounds overweight. You know, for a kid that weighed 150 in high school, I was heavy. And I was having a few chest pains and a lot of stress. And I just, it was one of those moments that I just said, you know what, I got to make some changes. Something's good. I'm not going to be around very often if I don't make some changes. I could be successful and be, you know, not here. So I started, uh, you know, losing some weight, running again. I hadn't run for years, getting back in shape. And then I stumbled onto yoga, which was my first foray into mindfulness. And it was an immediate uh, hit for me. It's like, wow, this awareness is really what I've been missing. I did that for a few years and my older brother, uh, turned me on to meditation, which I watched him. He was estranged from my dad. He was a poet. My dad was the football coach. And my dad said, you will play football. And they just grew apart and uh, hardly talked for about 10 years. And I watched my brother through meditation just gravitate back and change and gravitate back into relationship with my father. And my father didn't change. You know, he was he wanted a relationship with his son. But he wasn't, you know, he's in his 70s and pretty locked in. And, and I just watched my brother grow closer and closer. And I said, gosh, my, you've got my, got my family back. I'd like a little of this. And so I tried it and, uh, you know, really made a difference for me, stress-wise, purpose-wise, focus-wise. You know, uh, it, was, it was the right medicine for me at the time. You mentioned that through yoga, you found awareness. Yeah. What do you mean by awareness? Well, I just found that I was very much in my head, you know, living through my thoughts. And I, even though I was an athlete, I didn't really know the feeling of being in my body but, and how to get into my body and just inhabit that versus just being in the thought. So that awareness came from focus, being able to put my attention different places, starting in my body. And uh, where I was an athlete, that made a huge difference for me. It was something I could relate to, could bring into athletics, plus just bring in my daily life through a little yoga practice. And, note, and, and I believe the awareness is starting to notice when you're present and when you're not, you know, because we're all, I mean, I'm, on my best day, I'm still in my head, you know, a lot of the time. So it's starting to notice when I'm there and then, okay, now I'm, I'm with my wife or with a client or whether I should be present. This is a time to be here, you know, and let the thoughts go. And uh, meditation taught me how to do that. I'm trying to figure out if the body rules the mind or if the mind rules the body. And what I mean by that, you can look at somebody and go, oh, they're angry. They're depressed. They're sad. You can see it without a word, right? It's the way their body's positioned. And yeah. so my question is, does the position of our body drive the mental 
behavior or is it the mental behavior driving the position our body is in who, you know, chicken before the egg kind of thing. You know, I'm not going to hold myself out as knowing, but I will say my experience is it's both. For instance, uh, smile. You know, a lot of people say, well, I smile when I'm happy. Well, also I've learned that I'm happy when I smile. If I smile, it releases chemicals and puts a different, whole different uh, dopamine and, and a whole different, you know, grateful outlook on me. So I, I, think it, I think it's both. And I say another thing is, you know, the days a lot of people say, I don't feel like doing a routine or a workout today. I find those are the days that are most important because those are the days when through your body you change your mind. And obviously, I think it's the other way around, too. I mean, you can have a, a negative emotion and negative thoughts and have it just run through your whole body. I, th I think they're very much tied together, you know, that it's both. And you said something interesting. You said, when I smile, I then become happy. So then it's almost telling me, OK, you're forcing yourself, but you're forcing your body to do something. But the body doing it is then driving the feeling and the, and the rest of it. I can feel it right now. You know, I just feel a change, a chemical change in my body when I when I smile. The other thing is when you smile and you look at people, they tend to smile, too. Mirror neurons. Yeah. You know, mirror neurons. And, and it becomes it goes from one to the next. It, it, I train that, you know, when you're going into a really tough meeting. Eye contact and smiling is a couple of the best things that you can do. You know, just keep not a not a goofy, you know all your teeth showing every minute, but, you know, your lips turning up that you're, you know, that you are pleasant and it's infectious. It is infectious. There's a lot of those types of things. And again, that's something they don't teach in school is how to control your thoughts and your mind and how to control your body. Sure, you can play sports and they'll teach that. But even then, they don't show you to the level that can make you great. I agree. So one of the big things that you talk about is finding purpose in life. And I know for a lot of people, this is difficult. I know for me, it was it took a long time to figure out that struggle. And I went through a process. How do you help people or how do you do people find purpose in their lives? I follow the Eckhart Tolle came it was the first place I saw this, but you know, having an inner purpose and an outer purpose. My inner purpose is kind of who I am and finding that presence and consciousness so that I can be present and show up for whoever I'm with and whatever I'm doing. It's kind of my primary purpose in life is to show up present. And then my secondary purpose are my doings, my job, my parenting, my coaching, whatever those things, taking out the trash, whatever it is. And those doings are important because there's some doings, if they're things that I'm really good at and I enjoy, it's much easier to show up present in them. It's much easier to uh, be there, present with the people that I'm with and what I'm doing. So those outer doings are important, too. And if I can show up with that intention and presence, it's really powerful. You know, and really, that can be for, for people in our programs, we start off for a period. We say later you can change and do what you like, but would you try on for a while, six or eight months, just having your presence be, your purpose be presence. Just your being aware that you're with somebody and not somewhere else and practice that. Later they may think that's so how it's to serve God or, you know, something else more relatable to them. But that's my primary purpose is just to show up present. And my secondary purposes, my outer purposes are what I do. You know, if I with that inner purpose, it does change sometimes what I, what I want those outer doings to be. You know what my outer my outer roles are. I find being present to be difficult on an ongoing basis. And I don't think people realize how much we run on programming versus actually being present and making it's simple. Choices. It's simple, but not easy. Yes. And one of the big things is, is to start having the feeling. So knowing when you are present and when you're not, because then, I mean, as soon as I notice I'm not, I'm present again. As soon as I notice I went away and I'm in my, you know, 
like my, my, one of my biggest violations is just home, getting home for dinner with my wife. My mind is still stirring from a busy day. I go in, you know, and she knows, you know, she knows I'm not there. That's one of my biggest, you know, and it's, it's always the ones closest to me where I have to work the hardest at, you know, I don't know. I think, I think we get, so we think we already know what they're going to say and, you know, those kind of things, but it is difficult and that's why it requires some practice. I think the other thing that we do is start with really little doses, like two minutes, because the mind is, uh, we have some 6,000 thoughts a day. The mind is pretty busy. And if we go there and say, okay, I'm going to do 20 minutes or an hour or whatever, it can be counterproductive because the mind is so busy that we go there and it gets discouraging. So I usually encourage people to start with a minute or two. When that gets so that is rewarding and easier than move up to three, four, five. Uh, as the mind calms down, it becomes something that, you know, is a little more enjoyable and not counterproductive. So I say start, start small and be as consistent as I can. Like if I could do two minutes a day and even doing it daily is hard when you get started, you know, it's people resist it. Interesting. I guess, well, I mean, at this point, I know I can sit for a while. And so I, I guess I'm more used to that. So I don't really think of it as being hard. It's more just carving out the time and, and making sure that the time is always there to start the day there. And I think for me, the, the second half of it is, is bringing it back in the evening because I forget that part of it to take another couple minutes to shift again. And I think that's something that I'm working on at the moment. I'm working on that, too. I struggle with the second time. I've done uh, TM training where you did 20 minutes twice a day, and I, I did that for a period. But that second time for me, because I'm a goer, is harder. I find the second time a walk or a dip in the, in the pool or something sometimes is easier for me that second time of the day. But to do something that's mindful, that base, sometimes it's meditation the second time, sometimes it's not. The morning has been easier for me. That's a time where I seem to control my my schedule better. So I hear you. And, and I think you. it's important, though, if for that thing that like I say, well, I walk in with my wife, my family, you know, I want to be present. And I've been going all day. My mind's on, you know, a thousand different things that I'm trying to accomplish. And so that's the premise here. Because I'm also a goer. I think people struggle with the thought, if we slow down and we do these things, are we then giving up economic exactly. success? Right? That's profit with presence is to me is no, that what we're really training ourselves to do is to focus. And that I haven't met a, a goer that just stops wanting to produce, you know, but I've met a lot of goers that aren't very happy that have, you know, found ways to get material success and to do things, but yet haven't found that contentment or satisfaction in it. So I think you're really just training ourselves to focus and people, a lot of people say, I don't have the time for that. But once I get successful, you know, once I get over this hump, I'm going to take the time for that. Well, it's just more training over training ourselves not to be present. And the more we train ourselves not to be present, the harder that is to break. So I have, I've found that uh, focus makes us more efficient. The fact that, uh, you know, we have a real estate group called LC Real Estate Group is the, the founding of this. And we brought in an eight week program and did people and started instituting a half hour day before a half hour day paid before lunch where people could, we brought in yoga once a week or take a mindful walk or do something with the computers down. It's interesting, the partners, which are all goers, had a tough time shutting down. They wanted to do it in the morning or at night or something, but the employees just got a ton of use out of it. And we, no, we realized no reduction in productivity at all. That less time on Facebook, texting, all that kind of stuff, a little more awareness just really helped productivity. And it really helped congeniality in the office and all those things as well. But there is time. We waste a... If you track your time in a calendar for a couple of weeks, just, you know, we waste so much time. <laughs> and if you learn to focus a little more and, and then noticing a little more when you're going in one of those rabbit holes in your email or on a web or something, we can pull ourselves out of that. There's pockets of time that open up that uh, 
if you focus, it's amazing how much you can get done in a short period of time. And if you're distracted, it's amazing how long it can take to get routine tasks done. <laughs> I say it's focus. If I had one word for mindfulness, I'd say it's focus. And there's nothing in focus that is contrary to business or profit. People are busy, but they're not productive. They're doing stuff that at the end of the day doesn't move the needle. But because they're running on that hamster wheel, they feel like they're doing stuff, but they're not. And then it comes back to, this is all Parkinson's law, right? Whatever the time allotted, it will take, plus a little extra. You got an hour to do something, you'll get it done in an hour. You got three weeks to do it, it takes three weeks. And so when we constrain ourselves and we manage our calendar well, I have found that it's it's much better for me. And I even I like I won't stop working because working gives me constraints and those constraints force me to live life because now I have to get my life done because I got to go to work. So it's it's kind of that it creates good boundaries for me. I found when I don't have anything to do, things don't get done. I would agree with that. I'll add get to that. First, I just want to address the other thing is stress that it's very difficult to think clearly when you're highly stressed, you know, to really focus and think clearly through an issue when, I mean, we were stressed before COVID and then COVID hit us and it just went on steroids. And now it's, you know, inflation, the economy and Ukraine and politics and blah, it's just so much out there. If we don't have a refuge from which we can just take and get de-stress, then I think it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to focus and hard to be efficient. The other is, uh, uh, so when you asked me that first question, how'd you grow up? You know, I, I love to work. I love that structure. You know, I, I find things to do because I agree with you. I, and I had some times during COVID where I sit and had the day and I enjoyed it for a day or two, take a walk, you know, this or that. But I really learned, you know, I, I love doing things. I, you know, especially if I can be present and do them. You know, it's just, it's enjoyable to produce. And that's what I was going to ask you is, has COVID changed any of this more from the opposite standpoint of, you know, you mentioned, oh, I was traveling all the time. Well, now people are traveling less. Business travel is less. Even meeting travel is less. Like I built my whole business virtually before COVID. So it's easy for me, but everyone else is starting to find out. You know, it takes a lot of time to drive places, to wait, to do all of that. Have you seen it's actually been helpful for people or are they all being pushed back to the office and in, in situations that now it's come back again? I find it's a variety of things. What I'm noticing is, uh, uh, and it depends on the type of person. I mean, some people are set up for remote work. They're automatically productive and, and others struggle with it without having that supervision and direction and, and those kind of things. And ironically, I think often introverts enjoy their remote work more, but they need the office interaction. You know, they need to get out and to be around people a little more that they get into their hole and they have trouble getting out of it, especially after COVID, you know, a couple of years ago and I don't want to see anybody, you know, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's different. I also think it's another avenue where mindfulness can help make connection that you need. If you're a mindful executive, you're, it's easier to keep in touch with people be thinking about them and you know you might have to reduce your schedule a little bit because you really have to stay in touch with people that are remote you can't just forget about them you need to find ways to stay in connection i think you also have to find ways to have you know a monthly company lunch or some way where there is connection because you said earlier about body language i mean on zooms we don't get any of that in fact you know it's it's always a struggle for me half the people are blanking out their screens you know uh are they even there? You know, so. <laughs> and I'm surprised that that's been allowed. I, you, Me too. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man podcast. 
Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the Profit First methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. We, for the most part, 95% of what I do, 98%, we're screens on, video on. Like, that is the expectation. I'm in a mastermind group. It's like screens on. You're not going to hide. We want to yeah. see you up front. We want to know what you're doing, whether you're you're multitasking or paying attention. And same thing, all my client calls are face-to-face. So it's much easier when we're screen on and yeah. we can see what's going on. And, and the mind can't really tell if, if I'm sitting in front of you or if I'm sitting in front of a Zoom screen. There's certain things that can't be seen, but that connection, however, somewhat, full, but it's still there. And that's the same reason we get stuck on social media, because we feel like we're connected to someone because we see them up close and up front on our screens. Yeah, there's a balance with it, I find, you know, as with everything, you got to find a balance with it. Now, you said mindfulness quite a few times. What do you mean by mindfulness? To me, it's my mind is full of something at that moment i've chosen to be have my mind full of uh perhaps it's the words coming out of somebody perhaps if i'm meditating it's my breath to practice perhaps on a walk it's the trees and nature but mindfulness to me is having the choice of having my mind full of something to the exclusion of everything else because there's so much out there if I don't find a way to to rule a bunch of things out and then focus on what I want to, uh, then I don't have much of a chance at being productive at what I want to be productive at. But if I can learn to focus in and laser, through, and I call that mindfulness, then I can even in a busy, crazy world still focus in and get a lot done. Um, the uh, The other thing I was going to, I was going to just say is uh, business has gotten expert at stealing our attention, right? I mean, Facebook, Google, all these advertising. I mean, they've all studied how to steal our attention. And it, they're just going to get better at it. I mean, business is awesome. But it's up to us to turn the switch and say, no, I'm going to control my own mind and what I'm focusing on. So I think mindfulness to me and their little practice to say, okay, I'm going to... I need to learn how to focus on what I've decided consciously that I want to focus on. Be intentional. Totally. With everything. With everything, not just some things. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what's hard is at the end of the day at work, you know, you want to turn off. And so that's when it becomes easy to be unintentional. You talk about living in the gap. What do you mean by that? Well, to go back to thoughts, we have some 6,000 thoughts a day, plus a dialogue running, you know, typically inside. Uh, And it's those little gaps when one thought stops before another one starts, which where I find is where peace and joy and happiness is. And that in those thoughts is where stress and anxiety lives. So if I can slow down the mind a little bit and start noticing these little gaps, and it can be a gap... (laughs) In breath, gap before the out breath. Just practicing creating little gaps in which I just get little glimpses of, you know, not thought, but of reality, of what's really there. Uh, And some days I'm better at it than others. Some days there's no gap, you know, but living in the gap is searching for those gaps, searching for that peace and joy. Uh, those little spaces. It's like when you look out and you see a beautiful sunset or a beautiful mountain, you just go, ah, the mind stops for a minute, you know, just for a glimpse of it. And it just feels so good. It's learning how to do that throughout the day. You know, it's funny. We have sunsets and sunrises every single day. How often do people take the time to notice? 
they're there, whether or not you it's, notice it's, them it's or not. It's a special occasion when we do, <laughs> you know. And it shouldn't be. It should be kind of normal, everyday life. And pay attention to uh, to what's going on around us. You've got a, a new book coming out, Profit with Presence, The 12 Pillars of Mindful Leadership. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a culmination of 40 years in business and 30 years in mindfulness. Just principles that I've learned that are really effective to help us be present, but yet for business to be focused and still rely on goals and those kind of things. Because, you know, a lot of mindfulness community, it almost seems like business is a dirty word. And I just really want to give permission to people that it isn't that way. I mean, we live in a capitalist society. It's, it, it's really, uh, and I love capitalism. I love business. And so it's really showing a way in which you can be present in business, make a bigger difference, but there's no reason you can't have everything. There's no reason, you know, you can't have abundance. Uh, so it's showing how to live a life of, of abundance. Still making money is great, but it's not your purpose. You know, make money or profit is not the primary purpose of my life. It's something that I enjoy doing and I'm good at, but it's an outcome of taking a certain set of intentional actions. It's not like the be all and end all. Correct. Money is the result of living well and working well. And it's the reward for that. Too often when you just chase the money, you get stuck. When you chase the results of doing the good, you get both. And I think that's where sometimes people get off track. And it, to me, it's you. they always say, oh, you have to work on your business, not in your business, which to me is what mindfulness is, right? You're working on yourself and on your business, thinking through it versus being in doing the grunt work of the moment. Yeah, even just being present with a client or an employee or employer, just being present with them can be so much more impactful than you know, having ideas about it. So it's, there's, there's, uh, there's no, I haven't found anything in mindfulness that's inconsistent with business. And I also find most people that are really good at business, it's in their DNA. They couldn't stop making money if they wanted to. You know, it's just something, it's just something you gravitate to. And if you can be a little more present, a little more joyful along the way, then that's just a total win. RP, is that a learned skill to be in business or is that something just an innate drive that we're born with? I think it's primarily instinct. I think you can teach some skills. But, you know, I taught at the university here for 20 years at uh, Colorado State. And it was always ironic to me, most of the, I don't know most, but over half the people that we were looking to support the program through donations, you know, didn't even make it through college that the system didn't serve them. And you can look at all the, you know, from Bill Gates to Zuckerberg to, you know, all of these guys that, and we have a lot of them here locally. They, the, that system just didn't serve them and they went out and did it. And then often they, you know, they do appreciate education and they want to support it and those kind of things. But I think it's, I think it can help. I mean, there's certainly skills with accounting and computers and all these things. I mean, I learned it. I, I did nine years of college. I mean, I loved it. But most of I, I think business is an instinct. And you can and you got to be in the right environment to have the chance to do it. You know, and the opportunities and the support. And I also think if you don't have some of those learned skills from school, you can get yourself in trouble. I mean, for sure, you need to learn accounting you know, finance and those things. But a lot of people are self-taught. They're bright. It's, you know, if you can read and pay attention, you can learn those skills. So it seems to me that it, there's nothing wrong with the business education. I think it's great. And I think it would only, I, I think if you ask those leaders too, would they have preferred that they, they had finished and got the business degree or economics degree or whatever? I think they say yes. But in the heat of the moment, you know, they followed their instincts and most of them made out pretty well. No, no I kind of challenge that. I have an MBA. And when it comes to, did I learn how to run a business? No. Yeah. Did I understand, like, even though, I mean, I took accounting classes, but I think what it is, is they don't teach you how to, 
how to make decisions based on numbers. I don't know if that makes sense. They yeah, teach you yeah, how to put mean. numbers in boxes, but they don't necessarily teach you how to move the levers. So what I always promoted, uh, and I love teaching and I taught adjunct most of those years and came back and forth. And I love thinking of the theory on the way to the school and how I really was going to get it done on the way home. And, and I always said to kids, the internship is do an internship and school. That's super learning. See how, because it, what you're learning in the book is not really how it's done. The theories are the same and how, you know, IRR is calculated and all those things are going to be helpful to you. But really go out and see how somebody really does it. The other thing is you'll get no idea if you really like it or not from a book, you know. So you go to a few meetings, have somebody follow you around. We created a shadow program where you'd go and shadow somebody for a half day or a day and just see what they did. You know, um, so there's no experience, no, no substitute for experience. There's not. And that's why a lot of times when we do, when I do more, I, and I don't really do life coaching anymore, but when we do the life coaching side of it, I'll challenge people in what their assumptions are and what they say they want. You know, I remember this classic example of a, a woman who I was chatting with and she's like, I'd like to go to medical school and be a doctor. And I'm like, but you're a mom and you said you wanted to be a mom and a parent. How are you going to go to medical school and be a mom and a parent? Is there a part-time medical school out there? She's like, I don't know. I go, you need to find that out. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, what you truly want is not in congruence with what you think you want. And, and you need to test it in the same site. Some of those same people. Well, I want to go into the medical industry. Okay. The moment they see blood, they pass out. So either you're going to have to go into a specialty that doesn't see blood or you're going to have to figure out if that's what you really want. And I think testing it I out. I had a son that wanted to go and be in the Air Force, he thought. So when he got of age, I said, let's go take a flight lesson. And I'm not a pilot, but we just went and took a lesson, went up. He hated it. Never heard it again. You know, it was just... <laughs> Change tracks. It just was, you know, it was the idea about it, not the experience of it. And it's again, I think we experience can take us from our head and our thoughts into, you know, more of a real situation. So, And I think that's true for a lot of career paths, whether it be an attorney, a doctor, a nurse, um, engineering, like any of those particular areas. When you actually see what it is to do the work. Many times you're just not willing to put the effort in. And how often or how do you see like a law degree that no one's had any of that experience until after they've already been there? They go out into it and they go, I don't like this. Now, fortunately, it's not usually a waste. They've learned so much. They apply it in journalism or somewhere else or business or somewhere else. But they had so much education without the experience. They really they really don't know other than they were good at book learning. Well, and so that's why I think education needs to change to experiential. I love the mix of them. You can do both, you know, whether you're doing work halftime and that halftime. I think that's a that's a winner scenario. It is. And, and I think more hands on time shows you what you enjoy and what you don't. And I know for my daughter, while she was in college, she had different opportunities to work in different areas. And even though she was good at it. She yeah. realized this isn't what I where I really want to be. This it's not lighting me up. And for my son, he got real hands-on world experience with engineering, so it drove him further in that direction, but it mm -hmm. also made him a better candidate because he actually was in the space doing the work seeing what the problems were and learning how to solve them 10 years ahead of the curve. Because once you get to work, you don't get the freedom to play, right? You yeah. kind of have to make sure you deliver. When you're young, you get the freedom to play and to test and not be limited. And that's why we really are starting to, if you can get your kids at about 12 or 13 to go out, play in the real world instead of play make believe in school i think they will be light years ahead of everybody oh, else and they find that's one of the biggest things for self-esteem 
is so many people get it through work. I did. That was true for me. I, that's what I told you at the beginning is that a job and being able to show up, learn how to show up, how to set an alarm clock and actually produce something can just totally switch somebody's self-esteem from, you know, where they don't think they fit in to, oh, man, there is a place for me. I can do this, you know. And I think that's the other problem. When you're in school, you're in such a small lay, uh, pool, you don't get to see how much diversity there is out there. You don't get to play in that. And you don't get to realize that even though as you look around your your school group, you might be a little weird in the real world, that weirdness is actually greatness. <laughs> and now you fit in. And as you said, a lot of those very successful business people, some of them probably did well in school. Some of them probably struggled in school. Yeah. And it's because just, that's not their world. And yet we force everybody into that mold. Have to change it little by little. <laughs> Agreed. One of the things that you talk about is to practice acceptance, to drop all resistance. That's not easy to do. No, it's probably impossible to drop all resistance, but to work at it. It's just like we seem to constantly battle with reality, with what is. I just had this discussion. I can't remember who it was uh, this morning or yesterday was they were just really struggling, accepting that an em employee had just resigned on them last minute when they were taking a, a trip and they go, oh, gosh, how could this be? This is not, you know, this isn't right. This isn't well, but it's what happened. <laughs> so <laughs> when I when I start accepting it, then I can start to, to change it and do something about it. When I'm in resistance mode, my mind's closed. I'm just denying it. I'm pushing it off. I'm not looking for solutions yet. People think, sometimes they think acceptance is I'm just going to uh, accept substandard performance. You know, I'm going to accept not having things. I don't think it's that at all. It's just, it's, it's, not, it's not saying you don't want things, you don't want to produce, you don't want things to go a certain way. It's just saying I'm going to accept the way they are. And from there, then I can change. But I've been, I've been, if the opposite of acceptance is really denialism, denying something that is already there in a reality doesn't help solve it. So it's just trying to get flat with where we are. And I also think so many people want to have these lofty goals, but they haven't really set their base of where they are. You know, what's your credit score? What's your, you know... <laughs> What's your savings account? What are these things? Let's get flat with actually where we are and then chart out the other thing of, okay, here's my goal where I want to go. And then things chart out for what I have to do. But if I haven't accepted or gotten flat with where I am, I don't have a solid footing. And I think if you actually sit down and decide what do I need to do to achieve that success, some people may say I'm not willing to pay the price. And there's nothing wrong with that. Exactly. But don't delude yourself in thinking you're going to have X without doing Better the work. Better to declare it than to, to spend your whole life wishing, you know, without taking the actions to get it. Better to declare it. You know, I'm not willing to do that. I'm going to do this. I am willing to do this. Regardless of what society or other people tell you. Oh, that's a huge piece. You know, with so many of us live for what has been implanted through schools and parents and everything on what we've been told is, you know, the ideal. I, uh, college seniors, so many times they come in and I go, well, what do you want? Well, why are you here? And it would always be, well, mom and dad said they'd pay for it if it was engineering or business. You know, I said, well, I next step out is, you know, 70 hour a week job and then family, house, mortgage. You're going to wake up, you're going to be 50. I said, I take a little bit of time and challenge those assumptions and make sure it's something you'll be happy in because you're going to spend more time working than you're going to spend with your family. You know, we spend, you know, especially when you're starting off in a big job, I mean, 10 hour days are, are usual, you know? So yeah, challenge some of those assumptions and make sure it's what you really want before you spend your whole life getting there and then realize, Oh gosh, you know, this isn't this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Climb the wrong mountain. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, also, I think if you if you're on the right mountain, you're going to work harder. You find your purpose, you find your mission, you find your passion. You know, it's a lot easier to get up in the morning and work those Saturdays and whatever you got to do if it is the right mountain. And I find that to be very true. I love what I do. I only work with people I want to work with. And because of that, I tend to work harder. I tend to want to go deeper. I keep learning to make myself better. And it's because I'm I'm in that space. When I wasn't in that space, none of that was happening. Exactly. I wasn't putting any of the time and effort in, which means if I'm competing against someone who does, that other person is going to crush me just because they're having fun and doing what they love. And you're sitting here making it drudgery, which means you're in the wrong place. Make a change and go find the, the right place. And science is showing that if you're happy, you're more productive. You know, you're going to do better. If you're not happy, you're unhappy. And who do you want to deal with? Someone that's happy or someone that's unhappy? I'd rather make a call to somebody that's happy and enjoying what they're doing. That is very true. And I agree with that. I think part of the practicing acceptance is also turning off the noise. Because everyone, if you're watching the news, they're there to scare you and make you want to be fearful. So turning that all off and then learning to say, what is it that I can control and what can't I control? Focusing on what you can and letting go of what you can't. So most of what you can't control is out in the world. And there's another practice of accepting, you know, accepting the things I can't control. And if I can change it, change it. You know, if I want to change it, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, get, getting real about what you can change and what you can't change is is part of the practice. Most of what you can change is yourself, but nobody wants to do that. <laughs> Boy, that's sure been my lesson. I, you know, I spent years trying to change other people and I really learned I was the one that needed to change. And when I changed, they changed. My perception of them changed, and I also set a different example for them, you know, than, than I had before. So I totally agree with you. And that comes back to where we started with the story about your brother and your dad. Exactly. That was my first real taste of that, was to, to look and say, gosh, my dad didn't change. But their whole relationship changed, changed my whole family. You know, their family reunion has got to be fun again, you know, rather than people on eggshells. Well, exactly. to hear what are some of those other lessons that you've learned in life that we haven't chatted about yet? One of the lessons that I find people are really counterintuitive is service work, that so many people say, I'm going to wait until I make it, and then I'm going to go serve or write checks. Or... And I, my experience is that uh, service is one of the surest paths to success, that you First of all, it's gratitude and action. It puts you in the right mindset, puts you in a positive mindset. So you're looking for positive things. And it's more than gratitude where you're journaling about it. You're doing it. So it's more active. Secondly, the people that you meet, you take those intentional actions. Some of the biggest projects I'm a real estate developer I've ever come up with were at a nonprofit board meeting where we're going for coffee. And somebody said, I really enjoyed getting to know you. I think you'd be great to do this. Would you go talk to so-and-so? You know, I'm not there to do that. I'm there to help. Either it's a habitat or economic development or the university. But uh, it's so much uh, better than cold calling to get out if you can find service, especially if it's related that you're meeting other professionals in your field. And not you, you can't go out to do that because you'll get they'll smell it on you. You know, it's not, you have to be out generally trying to help, but that's karma. That's uh, things work at 90 degree angles. You know, I'm out for service and then somebody needs something and it's, I'm just there and I've been out in the world and it, and it comes up. So I'd say that's one of them. The other I would say is affluence. A lot of people say, uh, gosh, no, you know, money, that's not, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go out and try to help people. Well, you can help a hell of a lot more people if you got a little money. <laughs> You know, I say affluence increases influence. If I can step on and, and go on to a project and write a check and give, you know, and help bring people in it and do myself, then I can make a lot bigger difference. So I think the other life lesson is that, you know, money's not dirty. Money, I mean, it's your perception of it. It's also fuel for good. 
if you choose to. Money is nothing more than a tool. It's how you choose to use your tools. You use them for good. You can use them for bad. You can use a hammer to hammer a nail or hit somebody on the head, right? It's not the hammer's fault. It's yours and it's your perception and how you use your tools. And hey, some people don't use their tools well. Some people don't take care of their tools well. And some people use the wrong tools for the wrong purpose. So that's just life. (laughs) I just think that business can be such a force for good. And it's all a mindset shift. You know, business has made the biggest changes in the world. Uh, and it will continue to. And when business decides they've had enough of this malarkey uh, going on, I, I pull us together. I think business will be the one that pulls us to the next level, whether it's education or divisiveness or, you know, whatever it is. I, I just think uh, we're the greatest melting pot and we shouldn't discount our uh, influence on things, particularly if we were willing to pull together. I concur. We always like to get people to take action. What's an action step people can take this week to move forward in their life? It's pretty, pretty simple. I would say just start paying attention to your breathing. It's a little bit of an anchor. It's one of the basis of all mindfulness. Can lead you to formal meditation, but doesn't have to. I mean, that's not for everybody. But anytime I'm just noticing my breath come in and out, I'm present to that can anchor me in a meeting, can anchor me in, a, in my car, can anchor me in a conversation, tense conversation with my kids. If you just start paying attention to your breathing, it'll make you a little more present. You'll also notice when you're paying attention to that, you're not lost in thought. So it'd be that and maybe take a mindful walk, just a walk with your phone left behind at the table. And just take a walk and just notice it, notice your breath, notice the trees those kind of things, just start taking those little moments uh, to be aware and to notice your awareness. I think that's uh, a great action step and something we can all do is to stop being distracted and start paying attention to ourselves because at the end of the day, we are the most important person in our world, right? (laughs) Absolutely. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? Get out of a scarcity mindset and realize that I I can generate, you know, that there's enough for everybody and that me giving something away doesn't mean that I don't have it anymore. I mean, to be willing to share, I think. And let's face it, if we got something, that means someone else was willing to share. Exactly. Or we wouldn't have gotten it. And it's contagious, (laughs) like a smile is. It's contagious when you, no one likes to give to anybody like they like to give to another giver. And it also makes you happy. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? I was always pretty good at it, but what I never really realized was just how important relationships are. I've survived, I think, maybe hidden in the fifth, but the four major downturns since I've been in business and real estate. And its relationships has gotten me through every single one of them and had some downtimes in my family life. And when I really focused in, started working on myself, I learned how to improve those relationships rather than trying to uh, rather than trying to change people's behavior. Working on my relationship with them was way more powerful than just correcting all the time. (laughs) Nobody wants to be corrected. And they say you're not either. Your network (laughs) is your net worth, right? If you're hanging around with the right people, that's what happens. Well, and that's what it is, is also part of relationships is learning who you don't want to be around. Like I I say, I only want to be around people that make me bigger. I don't want to hang around people that make me smaller. And there's plenty of them. But I, you know, I just gravitate to those that make me feel bigger. If you were to give an 18 year old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Uh, work on mindfulness, work on your own happiness first. Then when you go out, you have something genuine to give to somebody else to base a relationship on. And I think that's not something we teach our 18 year olds, how to do it and how to focus on, on that. And the schools aren't, so it's, it comes to parents, you know, 
And if the parents aren't doing it, the kids, sometimes they get it somewhere else from some other mentor, but it's, uh, that's one of the greatest things uh, in our programs. I find uh, that people learn their relationships with their kids improves like on steroids that just being present with a kid is all they really want. They don't, you don't have to know what to tell them every time. They just want to know you're there. I used to coach uh, soccer and at the beginning of every season, when I would send the email out, um, we actually, we taught parents how to behave. And we said, when the kid comes off the field, all you need to say is, I love to watch you play. That's it. I'll take care of the coaching. You just make them feel good. Show up and clap and cheer them on. And we'll all have a wonderful time. I coach football. So that was not an easy job you took on there. <laughs> I, it wasn't easy. But when you when you set expectations and you you good for you, you exemplify expectations, yes. then you will get results. But if you are a hypocrite, you will not. So you, you have to put Makes the whole sense. thing together. If people would like to learn more about you, your programs, the book, where should they go? How do they find this all out? You know, the best is uh, uh, our website, livinginthegap.org, spelled out, livinginthegap.org. has all our programs. There's a newsletter you can sign up for, a monthly newsletter. There's free resources like a 21-day meditation program, learn to meditate, body scan, those kind of things. Access to the book is there, and that's also available on Amazon for presale. Be out in the first quarter, but uh, pres presence with profit. Profit with presence. Sorry, I said it backwards. And I got to tell you, I love profit. So I'm there with you. <laughs> Makes a lot of things possible, doesn't it? It wouldn't be possible without it. So without profit, you can't stay in business and pay your people well. That's just no, the reality it's, it's, of it. It's necessary. You know, it doesn't have to be your guiding star, but it's got to be there. So we try to teach people how to do both. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's been a privilege. I enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy your show. I know we've talked about this many times. Do you have a practice to focus on breathing and paying attention to it throughout the day? I have a program for the morning, but still fail to set one up for the evening. Be clear on your purpose. Know what we want and then ensure it's really what we think it is. And then you got to do the work. And that's the hard part, doing the work. But that's the key to living that richer soul life. What takeaways do you have to make one small change in your life from today's episode? How about this week's action step? Pay attention to your breathing to anchor yourself. Put your phone down. Take a walk. I think a lot of people have done this since COVID. People are changing the way they live. And good things come from bad things, too. And that's okay. You know, slowing down and being present, while it seems so simple, it is so powerful. You've heard it many times from so many guests. Make it happen for you. And if you're already doing it, make it happen even better. Next week, we have on Eric Brotman to talk about his book, Don't Retire, Graduate. It's essentially living life the way you want. If you enjoyed this episode or know somebody who would, would you mind sharing it with them? I would appreciate that. And they'll appreciate you. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.